inherently general recommendations aren't made for you. They're made for you, your neighbor, your friends, your coworkers, a whole bunch of people, but not specifically you. All right, welcome back everybody to episode 11 of the Building Lifelong Athletes podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Renicky, and today we're talking about all things preventative medicine. So this is kind of piggybacking on all the things we've talked about previously, but preventive medicine is a little different. Uh, there's some more specific targeted things that um, we want to talk about today. So that's kind of what we're focusing on. So we're going to talk about the different types of screening we're looking at. So it's kind of like an extension, like I said, of the previous nine podcasts that we've had or, you know, the necessary nine. So it's kind of like 9A. So like the nine things I talk about necessary nine, this is like 9A. This is super important as well. Uh, just a little... Not as, not as quite as easy for you to take in your hands, and so it takes a little more care and coordination with your physician. So like I said, most of these things are coming from your primary care provider in terms of screenings and things to look for and some things that require some testing and then are just a little more difficult for you to get on your own. And so that's kind of why we work in conjunction with our doctor to recommend these, but they're super, super important and uh, can get a lot of benefit from doing them. So like I said, sometimes you do everything right and you still draw the short straw, right? You know, we can have the perfect diet. We can, our sleep can be locked in, we're exercising all the time, you know, everything looks great and then something bad still happens. And that's unfortunately just how life goes. And so, but what we wanna try to do is try to catch bad things before they happen. That's why like screening is so important. That's why today we're talking about like all things screening and preventive medicine. Cause like I said, you can do everything right but still get cancer or still have something bad happen. And so if we can catch it earlier, the better we're gonna have. And we know that lifestyle is critical. Obviously you can control a lot of the health outcomes in your life by just doing the things that you do and controlling what you can control. And that's awesome. And I am a huge proponent that the vast majority of things are under your control, but obviously there's other screenings that we should be doing on top of that because things we can't know about. And so today I'm gonna talk about kind of prevention in there. One thing I wanna talk about first is the definition of prevention. Obviously, you know, everyone talks about like one single prevention, but there's actually about four to five different types of prevention that we see in the literature, you know, depending on who you're asking, but there's the five types that I'll talk about today. I'm just gonna kind of define them and give you some examples so we can talk about it. But the five types are primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary prevention. So that sounds like a lot, but we'll dive in just a little bit here to kind of make sense of a little bit. Primordial prevention targets the underlying stage of natural disease by targeting the underlying social conditions that promote the onset of disease. So that's a lot, but essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to remove the risk factors before they even happen. So like an example for this would be, let's say in urban areas, there's nowhere to walk. And so it's hard for people to get physical activity. You can improve access to walking paths, maybe like that. And that entail and prevents maybe type two diabetes or hypertension down the line. So we're really trying to like prevent any issues before they can even happen, removing the risk factors before they can even develop. So that's like the ideal with primordial. Obviously this is like perfect. If we get them in a perfect world, we're not gonna have any risk factors, right? We remove all the processed food in our world. We can't eat that. We remove any carcinogens in our life. We, I mean, all those things, like it's not practical a lot of times, but sometimes it can be simple enough where we can tweak some things and decrease the risks before they even happen. But that's what primordial is. So like really like before we can even like have a chance to get it brew or anything like that. And then we move on to primary. Primary here, the goal is to prevent the disease from ever occurring. So we're still targeting healthy individuals. So this is treating risk factors before the disease takes hold. So immunizations are like a perfect example of that. Obviously like risk factor wise, we can't get rid of like primary prevention for immunization. Like the disease is still exists in the world, but primary means like well, before we even have the risk or exposure to those deadly diseases, we can get the immunization. So primary would be like still working with healthy people and we're targeting before the disease can take hold at all. Moving on to secondary, this essentially is emphasizing early detection and targeted treatment. So this is once again targeting healthy people, but they have a subclinical form of the disease. So essentially it's brewing in there, but it's not showing any symptoms. So someone wouldn't know necessarily that they have some, a disease going on. So an example for this is like why we do pap smears in women. Essentially what we're trying to find is very early form of cervical dysplasia or like ab abnormal growth of the cervical um, cells. And essentially what we can do there is we can find it early and take intervention before it gets worse. And so that's kind of a lot of our screenings are there. Um, another one for this, like obviously you can find really, really early in colonoscopy, early colon cancer signs, you can take polyps out and do all that stuff. So we still have it, but you're asymptomatic and we can go from there. Moving on to tertiary, tertiary tries to reduce the risks and kind of the effects of a known illness. So essentially patients are already symptomatic. So we've kind of crossed that threshold where we're no longer asymptomatic, but we're symptomatic. And essentially this is like a damage control situation where we've, we've had issues and we've had the damage and we're trying to limit that. An example here is cardiac rehab in post heart attack patients. Obviously they've already had a heart attack. We can't prevent the heart attack, but, but we can work on things that we can control afterwards to kind of improve our outcomes after that heart, that heart attack. So cardiac rehab is an example there. 
And then quaternary is another one here that's interesting. It's an action taken to protect individuals from medical interventions that are likely to cause more harm than good. So this is the one that you may not see a lot and it's not as well talked as well known or talked about, but essentially quaternary, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prevent you from being harmed by the interventions we do. And this is super important because you'll see in America, a lot of times, you know, we talk about what's good for the population might be different from what's good for the individual. But a lot of times as physicians, like our job is to counsel people on like risks and benefits of everything, because there's always risks to everything you do. An example for this is if you get some sort of scan, you know, let's say you went to the ER for some shortness of breath and you got a scan and they happen to find some little like nodule on your lung or your thyroid. Well, what do we make of that? I don't know. That's the question. That's the million dollar question. We did the scan, we found something else and it leads to something else down the line. It can be issues there. So like I said, it's, it's kind of a, a catch 22 and we're looking for things we might find other things and so but that's something too it is a real harm to people so we want to kind of be aware of that as well but those are the general forms of prevention that we're looking for and obviously the earlier we are in the prevention of things the better we're going to be because we can detect them earlier we can actually do something about it right and so moving on here we're going to talk about you know why we screen and what are some big things that we screen for and you know the top two things that i think about all the time are cardiovascular disease and cancer you know cardiovascular disease is actually the leading cause of death in the united states one in every five deaths is related to heart disease you know like i say it's coronary artery disease is the most common type and it's just so prevalent in fact 805,000 have heart attacks per year in the united states and so i think 805 thousand people that's a lot of people having that so it's a huge problem it has tons of morbidity and mortality and so this is something that we should be looking for and trying to screen on top of that then we have cancer cancer is the second leading cause of death in the united states in fact there's 1.9 million new cases of cancer diagnosis in 2022 or about 5,250 new cases per day that's a lot so lifetime probability of developing cancer is about 40 percent for men 38 percent for women you know men most likely to develop things like prostate cancer lung cancer or colon cancer with prostate being by far the most common and females the most likely cancers are breast lung and uterine with breast being the most common like 31 percent. so overall like these are the two things that hey if we can keep these in check and kind of understand what our risks are for that these are the two big big things that we're screening for on top of that, there's lots of other things. You know, I, I kind of want to walk you through the USPSTF or United States Preventative Service Task Force. Say that five times fast. It's kind of this overarching organization. It is a huge organization, actually separate from the government. So that's kind of nice to know that we have some separation there. And they kind of help deliver recommendations to the entire United States on like what we should be screening for. They kind of help decide who gets what screening and when and why. And they look at like really a total body of evidence. They have the huge, they, it takes a lot of time to kind of come up with the recommendations because they look at a huge body of evidence and they kind of have the population in mind. I mean, think about it, you know, when I'm just talking with the patient one-on-one, -on -one, it's me and them, we're just talking about their life, their risk, but what the USPSTF, what kind of their recommendations and their framework is, is they kind of step back and say, hey, what's good for the population as a whole? And we'll talk about some issues with that potentially, but it's understanding that their recommendations are for the entire society, for the greater good of everyone. They have some really, really cool um, resources that we have. They have a website, which I'll link the website and the app in the show notes, but they have all their information on a website that you can kind of see, hey, what should we be getting screening for? When should we be getting it? Super helpful. I actually pull it up in clinic pretty much every day when I'm talking with patients to kind of make sure we're on, on the same page with all the screening, but it can be super helpful and it can help keep you informed about what you should be looking for. Essentially, the big categories they talk about are, I'll kind of say lifestyle diseases or like your lifestyle in general, cancer screenings, cardiometabolic diseases, infectious diseases, and then specific populations like pregnancy, childhood, or adolescence, those kind of big ones. And like I said, looking at individual versus population recommendations, the population like they're looking for, they're trying to do the most good for the most amount of people. And so they're, they're kind of taking into consideration harms caused by excess testing and procedures as well, like we talked about there testing people is not benign it's not like oh we just had a simple test because if something pops positive then you've got to you know pull on that thread and you've got to dig deeper and that can lead to other issues down the line so when we're looking at this here we're trying to cause the least amount of harm to people and sometimes excess testing can produce additional harm you know this population perspective considers a large group of people and it's not individualized individualized though is what should happen between you and your physician where we're going to tailor these recommendations to you right and like, let's say you have a family history of pretty extensive cancer somewhere that may require a more intensive workup, more thorough workup, an earlier workup or something like that. And so 
everything's gonna be a little different. You never wanna just have a blanket thing. So like I said, you may also wanna be more aggressive in your screening and you're okay with maybe getting false positive on something or leading to some more invasive procedures if that eliminates your even the consideration for something else. Like I said, everybody's gonna be different, but inherently general recommendations aren't made for you. They're made for you, your neighbor, your friends, your coworkers, a whole bunch of people, but not specifically you. So that's why you have to talk with your physician and kind of understand, hey, is this test, is this procedure, is it worth it for me? And have a discussion about the risks and benefits. Addition on top of that, you know, it's not perfect. Obviously, we know that it's not going to be a blanketed statement like their recommendation is going to work for everybody. Like I said, this is looking at an overall population and it's really good for a lot of people, um, but it's not going to be perfect. What they do is they kind of look at the research and they then grade it. They kind of say, hey, what are recommendations based off of literature? They kind of grade it to A, B, C, D, and I. A is the highest grade. You know, I think that's, at least they did that. That's pretty straightforward. Everyone wants to get an A, but A is recommended. With an A recommendation, what they're saying is there's a high certainty that the net benefit is substantial. So you're gonna get a substantial benefit most likely from that sort of screening test. Then the next one, moving to B, B is also recommended. So A and B are like both like, if they're A or B, like they're recommending you do it. But B means there's a high certainty that the net benefit is moderate, or there's a moderate certainty that the net benefit would be moderate to substantial. So once again, pretty much saying, yeah, we're, we're pretty convinced this is gonna be good for you in the long term. So A and B is like, yes, like pretty much no questions asked, we should be screening for this. Then next, moving to C. C is where we kind of talk about what we're selectively offering to patients. So offering to patients based on professional judgment and patient preference, there's like a moderate certainty that the net benefit is small. And so once again, it's not like A, B where it's like, this is slam dunk. We're definitely getting good out of this where C is like, ah, for the right person in the right situation, it might be helpful. And so this is one where, kind of, like I said, working on judgment with the patient and the professional kind of decide. D is recommends against. So that means there's moderate or high certainty that service has no net benefit or the harms outweigh the benefits. And so obviously very different from the first three. This is like, yeah, we're actually causing harm. And the final one is I. So I means there's insufficient data to determine. It's pretty much what they're saying is we can't strongly say yay or nay based off of the current evidence there. So obviously going through that, A and Bs are like, like I said, non-negotiables. Cs are individualized for every person. We're going to talk through kind of what the general A and B recommendations are. So at least like these are on your radar. You know, I don't expect you to memorize these. Heck, I don't remember. I don't necessarily say that even doctors should like memorize this because we have the app to kind of go through and walk through it together. But this is just so it's on your radar. So you can like talk with your physician next time. Say, hey, am I up to date on all my screenings? And we can kind of be proactive of that. So A grade recommendations we're going to talk about here. You know, first we talk about cancer. There's colorectal cancer screenings. And these ages are gonna be different. And like I said, every person's gonna have a different age, different set of circumstances, but general recommendations kind of here. Um, I won't go into every specific detail because that'll be a boring podcast, but cancer, things we're gonna be screening for are colorectal cancer. We know it's super important. Um, recently, they just switched it from 50 years old to 45. And so that's something to consider. If you're 45 or older, you now qualify for colorectal cancer screening or potentially earlier if you've had a family history of it as well. There's multiple ways to screen. Uh, the colonoscopy is the gold standard, but like I said, we're kind of getting some new ways to do it as well. But if you're 45, we should be looking for that. Other cancers we're looking for is cervical cancer. This is usually the pap smears in our female population. This is starting at age 21, looking for, like I said, kind of abnormal cells in the cervix so we can you know, intervene early. But cervical cancer should be looking for, uh, be looking for that as well. And then move on to kind of some lifestyle stuff. Hypertension, like we've talked about previously in an earlier podcast, super important. 18 years or older, pretty much if you're an adult, you should be screening for it. We also have recommendations for kids as well, but those are a little a little different. But hypertension, we should be looking for that as well. Tobacco smoking, we should be talking about that in all adults. Essentially, everyone knows that we shouldn't be smoking cigarettes or tobacco. And if you're an adult, we're going to talk to you and counsel you about it. There's insufficient data at this time to recommend against e-cigarettes because they just don't have enough data. But like we've talked about in an earlier podcast, I would not recommend that. I don't think it's really getting any net benefit. Specific populations, we talk about pregnant population. There are things that we're going to screen for, things like hepatitis B, syphilis, um, for, from an infectious pers perspective. Obviously, we're looking for um, any risk of having gonorrhea in the eyes of babies when they're born. So that's where they kind of get the eye drops. Also, we're looking for folic acid. If you're pregnant, it's super important to be supplementing with folic acid so you get enough. It helps the neural tube form in the baby. And so we're looking for that. And then also RH incompatibility, which is essentially your blood type. You know, if you're A positive, that's the RH there. And obviously, if there's a a mismatch there between mom and baby there can be some issues kind of down the line or they need to get a medication in there but just know that if you're pregnant there's a different kind of set of screenings made specifically for you and so obviously hopefully you're working with your ob guy or family med doctor on getting the right screenings for there 
In terms of infectious things, infectious diseases we're commonly screening for, syphilis is a constant one we're looking for. Essentially, they're, you know, it's recommended for all adults, but specifically adults with high risk, you know, people who are um, sexually active without protection, who maybe have sex work, uh, or in the military. Um, there's a bunch of different reasons for why someone would be considered high risk for that, but that's recommended for all adults who are 18 or older. Additionally, HIV screening is there. It's actually recommended for ages 15 to 65, uh, but particularly it's in high-risk patients, but they say it should be for everybody. High risk would mean people who have frequent unprotected sex, maybe have IV drug use, things like that. But um, if you're an adult, it does recommend at least a one-time screening, and then if you're at high risk, to continue screen there. And on top of that, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. So those are who have consistent sexual exposures to those with HIV, um, that's another recommendation for there. So those are kind of like the A, meaning like, if we screen those, like we're very certain that that's going to have benefit. Then moving on to the B, there's a lot more of those. So I'll kind of go through them a little quicker just because it's a little boring. But essentially for children and adolescents, obviously we don't want to forget them. They're very important to screen for them. And if we can catch things early in kids, that's even better than if we catch them in adults. And so things we should be screening for, things like anxiety, depression, uh, risk of suicide. Those are some big ones. But some other ones too we want to talk about, tobacco use. We want to make sure they're not having any tobacco use. They should always get screened for vision to make sure that their vision's okay. And then looking at dental caries or kind of cavities as well, even just screening for that. And also we should be screening for obesity in childhood. As we know, it can have some long-term consequences as well. Some other infectious diseases, not necessarily in kids now, back going back to adults, is we should be screening for chlamydia and gonorrhea and sexually active patients. Should be screening for hepatitis B, uh, asking about STI exposure, and then hepatitis C as well. That's getting recommended for screening for most people who are adults. Also kind of looking for like latent tuberculosis, if you have any exposure to that, history of that. Those are the kind of infectious ones. And then kind of the, the ones we've talked about before, are cardiometabolic ones, you know, we should be screening people if we need to start on a medication for cholesterol in terms of lowering their cholesterol. Should be screening for prediabetes and diabetes, like we mentioned. Uh, should be screening what their diet looks like, you know, are they having healthy dietary patterns? Are they getting physical activity? And so that actually is like, I just want to stop right there. That actually is a recommendation. We should be asking for healthy diet and physical activity for cardiovascular disease prevention. So hopefully, hopefully your doctor is talking about that, but I understand you have 20 minutes, you got to get in, got to get out, but that's super important to at least like mention it and to have you talking about it. Obviously, if you're watching this, you're probably super into that. And so it's not necessarily a, a, as big a concern for you, but it's something that you should consider and make sure we're talking about that. Other things we're looking for, something called an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, it's an aneurysm inside one of the blood vessels of your abdomen, just to make sure you don't have that. And we should also talk about weight loss in terms of to prevent obesity-related morbidity mortality. So those are kind of important things as well. From a lifestyle perspective, we're going to talk about, you know, the patient have unhealthy drug use, um, unhealthy alcohol use as well, intimate part partner violence to see if there's any concerns there. Um, from a lifestyle thing, also talking about osteoporosis screening and fall prevention in our elderly to make sure that everything's there. For mental health, we're going to talk about screening for depression. As every patient who gets in, you probably get some sort of screener. That's pretty typical that we do in the clinic that makes sure you have that. And then more specifically on the cancer front, we're going to talk about some cancers like like screening for lung cancer, breast cancer, you know, should we start breast cancer medication, BRCA or the BRCA gene, see if there's any additional screening we should be doing based on that, you know, talk about skin cancer prevent, uh, prevention. So a whole bunch of cancer screenings like we talked about. And, and then once again, there's other additional pregnancy um, recommendations as well. Like, do we need to start an aspen to prevent preeclampsia? We know when we're screening for gestational diabetes, uh, healthy weight gain, all these different things that we have. So we have a lot of them here. So that was a whole lot I ran through. I just wanted to like literally just get them on your radar. I don't really care that you need to know them. I don't think you need to, but I just want to, to put them out there so that you can have that conversation and you can be informed. If you say, hey, I've never even been asked, you know, I'm 50 years old and I've never once been asked for X or Z or I am 60 and I've never been asked to do a colon cancer screening, you know, things like that just to make sure, you know, sometimes things happen and you see different providers or you move or whatnot. I get it, but I want you to, I want to empower you to pretty much have the, the, uh, you know, the information so that you can go there and kind of ask and talk and say, Hey, are these the screenings that I need? And so, like I said, from the USPST, there are, it's kind of controversial for some things like people can kind of gripe, gripe on them and say, Hey, well, what's going on? Like they, all they care about is the population. And that's true. All I consider is like the general population, not specific individuals. Like one specific example is that, um, the USPSTF doesn't recommend PSA or prostate specific antigen testing for prostate cancer. Cause they've kind of found that they see in the overall that they were getting lots of people who had positive PSAs and they were getting, you know, biopsies and these invasive things that led to issues down the line. And they say, Hey, it doesn't seem like it's worth it for finding it. Whereas like the urological society recommends it. So there's some discordance between specific societies and people's opinions and the USPSTF. And so it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's going to kind of come down to a conversation. The question is, you know, 
how much risk and how much morbidity are we willing to have? You know, there's other tests, other procedures that can lead from, you know, positive screenings. And that's really the question is, so it's really tough, but at the end of the day, everything should be customized to you. You should be talking with your physician. You should be doing some research. You should be understanding, Hey, this is the risk I have. This is what I'm comfortable with and working from there. One thing I did want to mention as well, that's kind of making its way around the internet is full body imaging. So essentially people are getting, you know, MRIs of their full body. And so this is not obviously recommended by USPST, but it's just not feasible from a population health perspective, but it's kind of interesting. MRIs, we know it's an imaging modality that uses like really strong magnets to create super detailed pictures. It's really safe. There's no radiation to it, unlike CT scans. And like I said, it's, it's a, becoming more and more popular now. The idea is that you can kind of get this whole body scan to kind of see, hey, is there anything going on that's wrong? You know, quote unquote wrong. You know, the pros to this is, hey, like we might be able to potentially detect cancer earlier. You know, if you find a tumor on a pancreas on an MRI when it's really early, it might be beneficial. We have no pancreatic cancer screening tools. Like there's no test for that. There's no blood work, like nothing that we have and like that. So it is possible that we can find earlier masses, earlier areas of concerns or conditions that we don't even screen for. And so that's definitely kind of the, under, the idea of what's going on there. Things like aneurysms as well, they don't necessarily show up all the time. You know, we talked about the abdominal aneurysm, we can usually see it with ultrasound. There might be other ones like in the brain that we can't see or we don't screen for. So you can definitely find things earlier with these scans. Um, that's like the, the general idea is for like the pros, like, hey, I wanna know as much as I information as I can and I wanna look at it earlier. The cons are essentially financial. Most people, this is not a financially feasible thing to do. I was kind of looking at a couple, a couple places that offer this and it's about a thousand dollars for just a torso what twenty five hundred dollars for a full body and you know that's really expensive for most people you know especially if you're paying with insurance and your normal screenings all those other screenings i mentioned should be covered by insurance because they kind of insurance will usually line up with what the guidelines are and so you're not gonna be able to cover it with insurance and also obviously you need people to interpret this at the end of the day the, the radiologist will read it but then it comes back to the person who order it and then you say oh what do i do with this you know most people don't know what to do with any sort of incidental findings like we mentioned if we do a scan and we find something then it's on us to decide well what do we do next what's the next step is it a continued screening do we need another screen in six months do we need to do a biopsy you know we're going there with a needle and take a sample of it that's pretty darn invasive and so we have to have a, a plan here this can lead to more invasive tests, biopsy it online that can lead to, to harm. And that's like the, really the, the, the million dollar question is like, are we actually preventing anything? And then the biggest thing that the con that I see is like, there's no data showing any improved outcomes. Like intuitively, it makes sense that like, okay, if we find something, we can prevent it from getting worse. That does make sense. And that might be the case, but right now there's like zero studies that I could find that show like early MRI that we, you know, if we do this for people, it prevents this outcome later down the line. Once again, it seems intuitive, but I've definitely been wrong before where something seems intuitive and actually doesn't help. And so it's one of those things where right now the, the data is not there, but it's really gonna come down to you. The question is, is it worth it? Well, it depends. If you've got a bunch of money burning a hole in your pocket, it might be for you. It might give you some peace of mind and that you're that you're you know finding stuff before it's getting any any worse, but there's also a real chance that this leads to like additional tests, radiation, harm, interventions that you know you could have avoided had you never had the screening. So you really have to decide if it's if it's up for you or not. If you really want to do it though, you've got to do it with someone who's willing to go over the scan with you and can manage any complications or further investigations that come up. So you have to have someone to kind of you know walk you through it and kind of understand have a plan with. Once again, hopefully that's just your physician that you're talking about. But this is usually something that can't be ordered. Like literally, if you come into your general doctor and say, I want a full body MRI, they're gonna look at you and be like, no, I'm not doing that because it's just not a, a typical thing. It's like not covered by insurance. And there's specific like companies that do this now. I'm not going to like name any brands because I haven't done enough research to kind of vet any of that. Um, I personally haven't done this yet. haven't prescribed it, but I definitely have seen it making ways in the internet. And I thought, thought I wanted to look at it there. So I just kind of want to just a little sidetrack there to say that's you know, not evidence-based, but it's definitely becoming more popular. So I want to at least talk about it. And so at the end of the day, like I want to give some practical takeaways, right? So we only have one life and we want to live it as full as possible. And so we want to, you know, be healthy and lifelong athletes. I get that. So at the end of the day, my recommendations would be everything in the A and B that we talked about from the USPSTF is a good place to start at the minimum. These are essentially non-negotiables and like it's pretty, you know, effective and the data shows that we should be doing that. If you have more specific concerns or family history, then you might qualify for more. And once again, that's where talking to physician is going to be really, really important. And lots of these we've already covered. You know, we talked about diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. They're all, you know, included in these screenings and just once again shows how important they really are. And so it's really 
a lot of things that you can control. And then on top of that, things working together with the, you know, maybe more advanced imaging or whatnot that we can do. So, but every decision you make for screening will be a conjunction with your physician. Like I said, it's going to start with you and you're going to talk with them or have a personalized discussion. And at the end of the day, I think that's all we can ask for is like, we really, really just want to um, do what's best for you. And like I said, working with a team to kind of come up with what you're okay with and what like risk you're allowed with. So at the end of the day, you know, USPS TF recommendations, I would say start there. Whole body imaging, that is something I don't do yet. That's something if you want to look into it, you can, uh, but the data is just not there yet. And it's not, you know, going to be a broad recommendation at this time, but that's kind of the prevention medicine that a uh, topic that I want to talk about there. Thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Like I said, not the most exciting one, but this is kind of laying the foundation for what I think we need to do to kind of be, you know, healthy for life. And so once again, thanks so much for listening. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed that if you'd like subscribe or share this with a friend on me the world to me um, but thanks again now get off the internet go be active have a great rest of your day we'll see you next time